The delay was especially significant because of the context of local politics in Mexico City. That's a third aspect to bear in mind. The three men beaten by the mob were federal policemen, that is, dependent of the national government, whereas it was the local authority of Mexico City that was responsible for the rescue operation. So it was inevitable to interpret the whole episode as another chapter of the ongoing confrontation between the mayor of Mexico City, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, from the PRD, and the president, Vicente Fox, from the PAN. I'm uh, Dane Borges, director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at the University of Chicago. And uh, on behalf of the Tinker Foundation, which is the sponsor of this lecture, and of International House, which is co-sponsoring the, the event, uh, I want to uh, welcome you to this quarter's uh, uh, Tinker Visiting Professor Lecture, which will be given by Fernando Escalante, uh, uh, Visiting Professor in History. Fernando Escalante is a public intellectual of very wide renown in Mexico and in Spain. He's a historical sociologist of great accomplishment, and he has been a frequent visiting professor at universities in Spain and France. However, he received his PhD in sociology from the Colegio de Mexico, where he has also been professor, department chair, academic dean, in, in short, uh, I think everything that you can do at the Colegio. Uh, Mr. Escalante has published six books. Uh, and of, of those, probably the, the best known to historians is his study of civic culture in 19th century Mexico, Imaginary Citizens, uh, which explores the everyday moral habits and interests of various social groups following independence to show that it was virtually impossible for anyone to conduct politics as an ideal citizen, able to balance private interest with uh, public good. Now, this book has been through three editions. It's been extraordinarily influential. Uh, on, the, on those of us working in on political culture in early Republican Latin America. And uh, it's, it's made his, his reputation among historians as a, an extraordinarily erudite interpreter of Mexican politics. However, I'd say the bulk of his work has been on contemporary politics and, uh, and on p contemporary uh, political culture. Uh, the, his other books include uh, Political Terror, Notes Toward a Theory of Terrorism, and Other Little Prints, a manual for those of us in the audience or here today who plan to become Mexican politicians. Uh, a, uh, a survey of the social sciences, a notion of the, of the social sciences, and most recently, uh, La Mirada de Dios, which has been translated or is in the process of being translated into English by University of Texas Press under the title, In the Eyes of God, A Study of the Culture of Suffering. And if I'm not mistaken, that should come out this year from, uh, from Texas. So I hope you'll be with us and we can celebrate the, uh, uh, the, the appearance of, uh, of that book. Uh, he also may be known to some of you for uh, a, a recent book, Otro Sueño Americano, which he wrote in, uh, in conjunction with some other people, among them our, our colleague uh, Claudio Lomnitz, uh, as a response to Samuel Huntington's Who Are We? The Challenges to America's uh, National Identity. So, in the interest of eroding national uh, identity in the United States, while he's at the University of Chicago subverting uh, us, uh, Mr. Escalante is offering two courses. He's teaching political order in, in Latin America uh, in this winter, and in the spring he's teaching a course in political cultures of the left. Uh, he's also uh, been extraordinarily active on campus, giving talks. Many of you have met him in other uh, contexts. It's uh, with great pleasure that I uh, uh, welcome Mr. Escalante to speak today on the weak state in Latin America. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here with me and I would like to thank Dane Borges for a very generous and absolutely undeserved presentation. Uh, I hope you will not be too disappointed after that with what I have to say. Uh, I'd like to start with a brief account of a tragedy that happened in Mexico City a couple of months ago 
maybe a minor tragedy, but disquieting. By the end of November last year, in a small suburban town within the boundaries of Mexico City, San Juan Ixtayopan, a group of three federal policemen were lynched by a mob. Two of them died, beaten and burned to death, and the third one was rescued at the very last moment, badly injured. The riot began in mid-afternoon, around 6 p.m., and was finally dispersed by 10 p.m. That is, it lasted more than four hours. Sad and tragic as it is, lynching is not something unheard of in Mexico, policemen being one of the usual targets of such violence. Anyhow, some features single this particular one. The first one that turned it into a major national political event was that the riot appeared on television live. Journalists and cameras arrived pretty soon, maybe half an hour after it all started, and everything happened in front of the cameras and from a very close distance for hours. Some within the mob even addressed themselves to the cameras. They wanted to have it all recorded. At some point, the microphones reached the three policemen, one by one, and they told their names, rank, affiliation, and explained what they were doing there. The emotional response of the national public should not be a surprise. Much more important is the reaction of the people in the crowd. They did not run or hide from the cameras. They were angry, of course, not in a frenzy, although. Some of them were boasting, speaking in high tones about justice and insecurity, and sending messages to politicians and police authorities. The second remarkable feature is that the lynching happened in Mexico City, and it took more than three hours for the police forces to rescue the victims. The delay was hard to understand for everybody, and none of the explanations given by the authorities seemed satisfactory. City traffic, the distance, the difficulties to move police units and get them into the town's main square. The most compelling one was that a significant number of policemen was needed to control the crowd. For a single unit, or 10 or 20 men would only have made things worse. The explanation is very sensible, but quite revealing too. In fact, there were some local policemen in the town of San Juan Ixtayopan, three, four, maybe half a dozen, from the very beginning of the riot. They can be seen in the video images, and they appear to be just watching what is going on, not really concerned, nor trying to do anything, just watching. The delay was especially significant because of the context of local politics in Mexico City. That's a third aspect to bear in mind. The three men beaten by the mob were federal policemen, that is, dependent of the national government, whereas it was the local authority of Mexico City that was responsible for the rescue operation. So it was inevitable to interpret the whole episode as another chapter of the ongoing confrontation between the mayor of Mexico City, Andres Manuel López Obrador, from the PRD, and the president, Vicente Fox, from the PAN. The federal government and spokesmen from PAN readily seized the opportunity given by the media coverage and starkly criticized the local authorities. The general federal attorney decided to conduct the investigation on his own, and a few days later, the president demanded the resignation of Mexico City chief of police. The city authorities, for their part, publicly complained that the federal police had not informed them beforehand of the intelligence activities allegedly carried on by the policemen sent to San Juan Ixtayopan. There was, at the very least, a severe lack of coordination among the federal and local police. But things appeared to be even more complicated, for it is still not clear, even today, it's, not, it's still not clear what were those policemen doing in the first place. One version, volunteered by the three men to the cameras during the riot, is that they were investigating minor drug dealers around a secondary school. Another version has that they were searching for connections between drug traffic and the local police, and thus the delay and the seeming passivity of the city police acquire a different meaning. 
Yet a third story was disclosed by the press. The federal police was in fact looking for some guerrilla leaders said to be hiding in San Juan Ixtayopan, presumably under the protection of PRD local structure. The drug story, so, was a cover-up. A fourth story has been presented lately, a somewhat light version of the last one, stating that the target was popular organization in the, na in the neighborhoods around Mexico City. A fifth hypothesis cannot be ruled out. It was all of the above. I mean, the federal police was after or stumbled into a network linking drug traffic, guerrilla, local police, popular movements, and people from the PRD. Anyhow, the case was discussed, discussed in those terms by the national press, and that means that the idea does not seem absurd to Mexican public. Now let us follow the details of this particular incident and ask some questions. The main problem can be stated briefly. How could it happen? The answer given by most of the media and political class in Mexico is simple and deceiving. It happened because of the inept, slow and irresponsible reaction of the city police. It might be true to a certain extent, but largely insufficient as an explanation. It fails to address the main issues at stake. Why that ineptitude? Why the rage of the crowd? Why the riot in the first place? The dynamics of a lynching mob are well known. The anger and the violence are usual responses to fear. The search for a scapegoat is triggered by a minor event in a context of widespread sense of insecurity and resentment. A number of different grievances, fears, and anxieties crystallize in a single image, threatening and pressing, demanding immediate action. In this case, it was the rumor of children being kidnapped by an international network dedicated to the traffic of human organs a modern version of the ages old stereotypes of anti-Semitic persecution. The anger is more or less easily explained, and so are some of the practical difficulties of the police forces to control the riot. What really matters is that nothing was done or nothing could be done to ease that anger, to prevent its, out its outcome, save for the use of force, and it was too late. Of much interest is also the fact that the targets of such violence were policemen. It is not unusual in Mexico or in other Latin American countries. But for that very reason, it is remarkable. It says something about the relations of state and society. With some exaggeration, just to highlight its meaning, we may picture it as a reverse image of the Leviathan imagined by Thomas Hobbes, that mortal god made by the joint will of a will of a world people. Some numbers might add to the significance of the event. Until 1993, there was an average of four lynchings every year in Mexico. From 1995 to the present, the average jumps up to 40 lynchings per year. That is almost one every week. Other countries in Latin America show a similar, a similar picture. Although the statistics are not always accurate, as is easily understandable, for what we know, the average number of lynchings in Bolivia, Guatemala, Peru, Venezuela, is somewhere around 15 to 20 per year. The phenomenon seems to be insignificant only in Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. If we look for the attempted lynching, even without a deadly result, the numbers are much higher. In Mexico City alone, in the first two months of this year, the count is 23. Now let's ask what's happening. And just one sidestep before. I am aware, as you are, of the fact that Latin America does not exist. Some common traits and patterns allow us to draw a general picture, but anything we say about any group of countries in our region will need further qualification, taking into account the specific history of each country. The last decades of the 20th century were largely optimistic in Latin America. Great expectations were awakened by the liberalization of the economy, the democratization of politics, and the empowerment of civil society in public life. The results have not been encouraging. Something has gone astray, and one of the main sources of disappointment and bewilderment is democracy. At a distance, 
The models and would-be theories of transition to democracy that were fashionable 20 years ago seem typically naive. It is now almost universally acknowledged that they did not take into account the historical and cultural dimensions of democracy. As it has been phrased lately, they did not recognize the problems posed by the absence of a civic culture. I would like to argue that it is another way of saying that they did not pose the problem of the state, or, as I would rather put it, the problem of the weakness of the state. Most of the theories and political activism assumed that there were authoritarian states that needed democratization, as was the case in Spain after Franco. The focus was on the political system and mainly in the electoral processes. Now we have free and competitive elections in almost all Latin American countries. As it happens, it is not enough. Many of the problems usually associated with the authoritarian regimes are still in place. Corruption, clientelism, capricious government, large areas of legal uncertainty. Slowly we are coming to realize that we do not have strong, self-sufficient states capable of enforcing the rule of law. A strong hypothesis would say that the problem is to create a state. A light version, much more common, finds a need of a stronger and maybe rebuilt state. However, any such attempt is complicated because we are not on flat ground. We have had political arrangement, sometimes stable and even powerful political machines, with some state-like features and ambitions, and yet unable to perform some basic state duties. The Latin American state, as imaginary institution, has a long history behind it, and so do the actual agreements that shape the political field. On the new circumstances, those political arrangements strive to assimilate themselves to the democratic processes, and in doing so, they tend to impose a bias on the political system, not for, but against, the strengthening of the state. To make things clear, it would be useful to start with a minimal definition of the state, a really minimal and obvious one. It is the state, a political institution that rightly and efficiently claims for the monopoly of legitimate violence. Even there, at that basic formal level, there are problems for our states, mainly because the monopoly of violence cannot be taken for granted. But we need to extract a little more from the definition. We have to assume at least a general purpose, a general function that is. We have to assume that the role of the state is to impose upon everyone the compliance with, with a set of rules, even by the use of force. This is indeed a Western idea of the state, but it, it has been as such an almost unquestioned notion for our societies. Even from that point of view, it is obvious that our political institutions, our states, fall short of that ideal. They are at least very weak states, unable or unwilling to perform such very basic duties, indispensable for all modern institutions. A strong state, let me spell it out to avoid misunderstanding, a strong state is not authoritarian nor arbitrary. It is not a wealthy state or a military powerful state. It is but a state capable of imposing its own logic to society. That is, a state that can enforce the rule of law as a matter of daily fact upon everyone, including government officials, including politicians. A state able to arrange and organize social life within formal institutions, within a, frame, a constitutional framework and according to the patterns outlined by the law. To strengthen the state in Latin America, according to that definition, would mean to improve its overall capacity as sovereign institution. In other words, it would require for a start to eliminate or reduce to a great extent the prevailing forms of corruption, political patronage and clientelism, to create some sort of civil service and to guarantee order and security through effective law enforcement. All this would have to be done, let us keep it in mind, in a context defined by widespread poverty, very scarce public resources, and the pressure of democratic competition, which means that it would have to be done in a situation where everything contrives to some sort of populism. 
The historical causes of that weaknesses are manifold and disputed. However, it is possible to describe and even measure it with two main features, financial weakness and legal weakness. <clears throat> First, financial weakness. Our states do not have enough resources to meet the demands and explicit commitments of our constitutions and not even to accomplish the most basic tasks of a state. They are not able to collect taxes and depend to a dramatic degree on international oil prices, for example, or copper prices and international interest rates. They cannot afford to have a professional civil service, and for many years they have not been able to invest on basic infrastructure. For that very same reason, the bigger their commitments of education and health mainly, the weaker they become as states. We may also take into account to get the whole picture, the growing informal and underground economy, the need for special fiscal treatment to attract new investments, and all that get lost through political corruption of every sort. It all adds up to the basic fact of the financial weakness of the state. A stronger state would need not only much more money, but a stable, secure, long-term income that is far out of sight for the time being. State strength is not a matter of wealth as such, but of equilibrium between public income, public expenditure, social welfare, and economic development. Now the second feature, legal weakness. Our states are not capable of imposing the rule of law as a general fact. They cannot even count on a law-abiding body of bureaucrats, civil servants, police forces, or judges. It is not that the state authorities are corrupt as a rule, in most cases, it is only a problem of control. The state cannot enforce the law. At the extreme, this means that the state authorities do not have an effective monopoly of violence, not because of the existence of organized violence outside the law, but because of the usual practices of law enforcement agencies. Of course, there are guerrillas, there are private guards and powerful structures of organized crime, but the problem goes deeper than that. It is the routine and massive privatization of public forces. Through bribes and other forms of complicity, citizens can use the public forces for private purposes, either to cover up small infractions or to support networks of international drug traffic. So state authorities do not fully control the police and the army and are in no position to guarantee law enforcement as a matter of fact. The weakness of the state that I have described does not need to be catastrophic. It does not mean anarchy or anything like that. There are many ways to exercise power and create political order. There are many alternative forms of government apart from the public sovereign territorial mode of the modern state. On the other hand, the weakness of the state does indeed hamper the performance of modern institutions, the market for a start, and can be a major obstacle to economic development. As it happens, state weakness explains some of the odd and disquieting results of democratic systems, but it certainly is not enough to elucidate the murderous crowd of which we were talking about. I would like to argue that lynching is not in any sense normal or customary. It is not a traditional way of doing justice. It tells of the state weakness, but also of the breaking up of that alternative political order we've had for a century. Given the absence of a strong, sovereign, efficient state, it is not surprising the lack of a civic culture or a common legal consciousness, for there are no grounds for them. We should not expect a political behavior similar in every way to that of Western Europe or the United States. But there is an additional problem that adds to the state weakness and makes it even more difficult to impose the rule of law, and that is inequality. It is very well known that in all our countries there are huge income inequalities. In Mexico, just to take an example, the on, uh, only the upper 10% of the households earn more than $3,000 a month, and those pertain to a middle class, only the 10 upper percent, whereas the lowest 10% live on less than $100 a month. 
But inequality under the circumstances is not only a matter of income. More important are the social, cultural and political inequalities. If we consider the goods, services and resources available to the urban middle classes, that is, the consumption patterns, opportunities for education, health, health services, resources of information and communication, etc., and compare them to those available to the lower 30% of the population, living in rural areas, most of it, we find a cultural gap of the major importance. Inequalities are of, so, of such nature that amount to a distance of two centuries and appear in every aspect of life, in the modes of production, in patterns of family life, in forms of political organization and leadership, etc. Of course, this is not new, but there are some new trends that matter. First, the new opportunities for consumption, education and communications opened in the last decades have pushed even further the upper classes and have widened the cultural gap. Second, due to new dynamics of the world economy, inequalities tend to become increasingly rigid and they tend to consolidate a geographical pattern of poverty that leaves some regions aside from any development. Under these circumstances, even the most efficient and able government would find it hard to impose the rule of law on a regular basis and, as a matter of fact, requiring every citizen the same conduct. What happens in daily practice is that every decision, every law, every policy has to be negotiated since there is not a common ground for the exercise of authority. There is not and there cannot be a single political culture nor a single shared value system to support and shape political life, but a number of different cultural patterns mixed, loosely linked, sometimes interwoven but nevertheless different, rooted in different economic and social environments. So there has always been a need for political intermediaries or political brokers to match in some way the needs and interests of society and the requirements of the law and political order. Political brokers, be them union leaders, caciques, businessmen or bishops, have been able to produce political stability at a local level but at the cost of making it possible the rule of law. It would be no otherwise since the, the task of the brokers is to negotiate the selective infringement of the law to produce order and, of course, reproduce their own parasitic political power, by the way. Unequal as they are, fragmented by economic, geographical and cultural cleavages, it would be misleading to think of our societies as weak the manifold inequalities and cultural differences have made it impossible for a strong nationwide civil society to emerge. Furthermore, we still do not have a set of stable, efficient and trustworthy institutions at a national level, not even a national market to begin with. Lacking them and lacking the guarantee of law enforcement, there is no reason to expect the flourishing of a civic culture or a civil society. However, our societies have been able to produce a political order of their own, not a civic order, not fully integrated, but a fairly strong and lasting order, in a way opposed and resistant to the state, and yet somehow linked to state institutions through a brokerage system. Eventually, according to Alan Knight, a mafia-like brokerage system, so be it. It is not a single unitary political system, for there is not a single political culture or a single network of brokers. Instead, it is a complex bundle made of a number of different codes, practices and value systems available in a repertory that includes the modern legal and political languages as well. That complexity sets the pattern to negotiate political stability and turns the state into another political actor and not the ultimate authority. The situation is very well known in general terms. I would only like to stress a couple of points. First, the result of this coexistence of different value systems, so to speak, is not chaos. Most of the time, every political actor knows what to expect and how to behave, including state officials. 
Second, there has not been a sleepy and submissive society that could be ruled at will, but an active and political organized society that just does not fit within the framework of a modern state. And third, it is not a traditional society in any meaningful sense of the word. It is wholly modern, for it has been shaped in an active relationship with the market, the law, and the state. I take all this to mean that the weak state has been at the same time a problem and a solution, and that is why it is so hard to deal with it. The problems are too obvious. The weakness of the state prevents it from performing its basic duties and has been for that reason a major obstacle to development. The dynamics of clientelism and political corruption, all the practices we summarize in the word corruption, tend to distort the market rise transaction costs and hamper institutional development. And at the same time, they inhibit the growth of a legal consciousness and a civil society. These problems are very well known. So the weakness of the state is a symptom and a cause of what used to be called underdevelopment. Seen from this point of view, it is not surprising that anyone that thinks about modernizing Latin America or developing Latin American societies comes to the conclusion sooner or later that it is essential to strengthen the state and then use the state as a means to modernization, to impose the rule of law, to generalize market relations, to create the basic ground of shared values and political patterns that make modern citizenship. It is the road most taken, from the Bourbon reforms to the last military dictatorships, some of the liberal governments of the late 19th century, or even to a certain extent classic populist regimes, there runs a common aim to modernize our societies by using the force of the state. Leaving aside all the political and humanitarian costs of such attempts, there remains the fact that all of them have failed in the long run. The state has not been able to modernize our societies. Even more, when and where those strong governments as buds of possible stronger states, where and when such strong governments have succeeded, they have transformed only parts of the society. They have created, so to speak, fragments or patches of modernity, of European or North American-like modernity and thus have contributed unwillingly to reproduce the lasting patterns of inequality of which is made the old brokerage system. On the other hand, the relative weakness of the state has provided a solution to the basic and pressing problem of political stability. Not the ultimate solution, nor the most efficient or just, maybe, but often a reasonable or at least an acceptable compromise. The weakness of the state has allowed the functioning of the brokerage system while maintaining a modern institutional framework. It is a fact, and not a surprising one, that from the independence onwards, our political imagination has kept a standing commitment to the values of liberty and equality that structure the modern state. This may have been not in spite, but because of its failure, our commitment is a result of the failure. Anyhow, notwithstanding some eccentricities, there is no way back towards a Catholic, cooperative, organic society as might have been that of the Habsburg monarchy. But all the same, it is obvious that we cannot live up to our ideal, our modern ideal. In other words, our societies are trapped between practices that cannot be justified and laws that cannot be enforced. I would not like to be misunderstood as fantasizing a pastoral of the good old mafia days. It is clear enough that our societies are and have been unjust, inefficient, violent, burdened by parasitic politicians and parasitic businessmen alike. Nevertheless, if we are to understand what is happening, we have to recognize the old brokerage system and the weak state for what they were and we have to measure our present hopes and disappointments against those of the past. As I said, the mainstream theories to transi of transition to democracy focused on the most salient feature of the formal political system, the political parties, the elections, relationships among elite members, but they overlooked the problem of the state. 
as a consequence, academics, intellectuals, and not a few politicians, underestimated the strength of the non-civil arrangements of our non-civil societies. They took at face value the demands for democracy that were much more ambiguous and misleading. The result, as could have been expected, is a democracy that produces strange outcomes and is always on the brink of sliding towards some sort of authoritarian populism. As it appears today, it is not only the problem of a weak state penetrated by social interests and distorted by the arrangements of political brokers, but a state that cannot work anymore under the old rules, since it has been weakened further by the very attempt of making it stronger. While the traditional political class has lost some resources, has lost prestige and even the capacity to generate order, that is the present situation. Several basic policies carried on for the last 20 years were designed to modernize our states, to strengthen our states, assuming that they were overburdened by political payoffs and commitments, and taking for granted the existence of a regular market and a civil society. So, following the international trends, there was an attempt to secure state authority through democracy, and efficiency, which meant the privatization of public enterprises, the liberalization of the markets to avoid political interference, the stabilization of public finance, and a hardening of policies against organized crime, especially drug traffics. Some very basic assumptions about the market were basically wrong, as were the implicit beliefs about civil society and political parties. Most frequently, it has been underestimated the extent to which our political arrangements were already modern and therefore capable of distorting and using for their own benefits the new pol policies and the new institutions as they have. As a result, we do not have a stronger state, but a more rigid state and a more fragile state, with almost no resources to sustain any consistent economic policy committed to a free market that does not work properly for lack of institutional support, committed also to a hard policy against organized crime that cannot be backed by law enforcement agencies or judicial system, and states open to democratic competition that has known of the automatic restrictions and self-controls of a civic culture. The state is thus weaker. But the broken system that is still needed is needed as badly as ever, is weakened also. There are fewer resources to keep it working. It somehow clings to the political parties and exert pressure on the democratic system, but has no guarantees and can offer none for political stability. So we have seen shattered the old political class almost everywhere. We find discredited political parties along with incredibly fragile governments. Just to point a marker, in the last 15 years, we have seen impeached or overthrown, not by military power, the presidents of Brazil, Fernando Collor, Venezuela, Carlos Andrés Pérez, Ecuador, Abdala Bucaram, Peru, Alberto Fujimori, Argentina, Fernando de la Rúa, Bolivia, Gonzalo Sánchez de Lozada. That's quite a record. The old tragic choice between legal state authority and political stability seems more straining than ever for both of the alternatives, the strong state or the strong brokerage system appear to be out of reach. A seeming, a seeming exception comes to mind immediately, Hugo Chavez. No other chief of state has been under so hard scrutiny and pressure no one has had to deal with such a strong, widespread, resolute and lasting opposition, national and international, aiming directly at removing him from power. It might be unsettling, but quite instructive to ask ourselves why and how is he still in office and winning elections. Let me go back for a moment, just to finish, to the events of San Juan Ixtayopan. The day after the lynching, the federal police arrested about 20 residents among those involved in the murders. As could have been expected, there followed an unquiet week full of complaints and accusations. 
Among all what happened, there was one very minor incident that called my attention. Gilberto El Sastiga, a federal congressman, went to San Juan to talk with the people and try to appease them and eventually have them support his party, the PRD. Again, it was all on TV. At a more or less spontaneous gathering in front of the local church, he explained that he was there to express his and his party's support for the distressed and aggrieved people of San Juan Ixtayopa. It was an astonishing statement, to say the least. But even more was the reaction of one of the ostensible leaders of the assembly. He took the megaphone and addressed himself to the congressman in a very angry and sour tone. We do not care for your support, he said. You are a politician, so you have money. We want you to pay for a good lawyer and take our people out of jail, and that's it. Watching the scene was an uncanny experience to me. It was like a sudden return to the 19th century. Of course, it was a reminder of the weakness of the state, but it was much more than that. Not only had the police and the local authorities been powerless and ineffective the night before in face of the riot, but also was the political broker in full daylight. For a moment, it was as if behind those bitter faces and whispers, I could hear the creaking of the old Mexican political arrangement and also the slow disbanding of Leviathan. analysis sort of with the more familiar discussion of the last 20 years being familiar especially in a place like this one I mean a university that has been for a very long time ago at the forefront of pushing for the kind of market reform that some Latin American countries actually described on the two um, it's from the 80s on um, you know that is to say that, that uh, the solution to Latin America's economic problems and I suppose by association that argument, some of his political ones that you suggested how that is by ending patriarchy and so on, was really a smaller state, a, 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 a nimbler state, a more efficient one, that is, a, and, and therefore, as you suggested, privatization uh, and so on. So, so uh, it was really an economic argument with, 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 with very heavy political undertones. And, uh, and uh, since clearly your argument, although it comes from a different perspective, is arguing for something very different, I wonder what is the relationship between those two, those two concepts. I mean, you can define them any way you want. Big and strong. I mean, it's bigger. I mean, it's stronger necessarily is bigger, and you, you can be free to define big in any way you want. No, in fact, a bigger state uh, more, more probably would be weaker, since it is committed to spend money that it doesn't have. Uh, anyhow, they, they, not necessarily a strong state is a big state neither a uh, uh, strong state is a smaller state. It all depends on, um, let's say, uh, the patterns of development and uh, the possibility of a civic culture. If we're talking about a society like France, for example, with long-standing civic traditions and with uh, stable national market, etc., we can expand or reduce state intervention in the economy or the state uh, uh, expenditure. We may, might have or have not a national banking system, etc., and the state remains strong because there's a civil society, a network, uh, that supports it. But if in our countries, in Latin America, where we do not have um, neither a national integrated market nor uh, any system, education or health system or stable uh, 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 similar economic conditions, it is hard to uh, find how a state that does not intervene, at least in education and health, providing health services and education, etc., 
could be a strong state because uh, it needs to build the uh, civic culture through those channels. I cannot see a state being strengthened without those resources in Latin America. As for the intervention in, uh, intervention in, uh, in the economy, um, it's misleading to uh, think of the states of the 40s, the 50s, even the 70s as strong states for the uh, intervention in the economy. What we saw in most of our countries was not a strong state imposing uh, its order to the economy, but a generalized politicization of markets that's very different. I mean, th there was a, a, a transfer of powers to the political brokers in the e economic system, to union leaders, for example, and to uh, businessmen linked with the political parties. It was a politicization of the markets. Uh, it was not, um, I, I repeat it, a state imposing its order, its idea on uh, uh, the, econo the economy, but it was a political class politicizing the markets. So we've had, we have not had a strong state, neither a big state, it, it, because it was, not, it was a state-like or state-aspiring uh, 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 intervention, but it was mainly a political intervention. It produced a, a, a significant political power for those uh, uh, networks of, of brokers. But uh, it did not uh, help to strengthen the state. I don't know if... if, if I just wonder how would um, Chile fit into your analysis of the Latin American state during the 20th yeah. century? Uh, especially you argue that using the monopoly of violence in order to develop the civic society is uh, a failed solution. Some might argue that Chile used this monopoly of violence and achieve the prosperity that we nowadays encounter in Chile, the only developed country in Latin America. Yeah, uh, well, always when talking about Latin America, the, the exception is, is Chile. But that happens from the 19th century onwards. And the exceptions, uh, the exception, the Chilean exceptions, seems to have been built by uh, Diego Portales. Uh, that was the sort of a model for all Latin Americans uh, governments uh, throughout the 19th century. Uh, of course, there are different uh, uh, patterns in, in Chile due to the size, the population, the uh, geography and the geopolitical uh, characteristics that um, gave a sort of demographic and uh, 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 strategic bonus to, to Chile for being where it is and so uh, of the size uh, as it is. Um, uh, anyhow, the, 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 it is hard to generalize uh, from the political and uh, the, the economy of Chile. What was done under the Pinochet regime cannot easily be translated into other realities. Uh, so it is hardly a model, as was hardly a model, the, the, the one uh, uh, created by Diego Portales, even though it was uh, uh, looked as uh, an example, still the, the the economic the Chilean economic model is much more vulnerable than uh, uh, people tend to think. Um, the privatization of the pensions, the healthcare system, the social of all the social security creates uh, uh, an economic system that depends on increasing, uh, on keeping the growing of the national uh, product. When it starts to slow its, its path, the risk is that bunches of population f uh, fell out of the private system of pensions, healthcare, etc., and thus create a very dangerous uh, situation. Uh, anyhow, everything from the Pinochet regime onwards has been different in Chile. It, it uh, paradoxically, it's um, the, the 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 country with more, uh, or maybe m more lasting civic traditions, together with uh, Argentina, and the transition to democracy under the uh, Concertación model was made as to avoid really democratic competition to avoid facing democratic competition in election day. So they built it before 
during uh, uh, in selecting the concertación candidate in every time and that made the political arrangement after pinochet vulnerable to criticism the criticism of lavin in the election of 2000 for example and has made it uh, uh, an exception that is coming to an end. Lagos has now distanced himself enough from the concertación as to pose a very uh, different uh, uh, arrangement for the next election. So we have to wait and see if Chile uh, joins and you know a fully democratic competition um, after the concertación and with an economy that is not growing as fast as it used to if it joins the patterns of the rest of Latin America, or if it resists as a more civic uh, model. I'm not sure. Can you uh, go a little bit further at the idea of the lack of the um, national market? Are you saying that, that, can you describe or define what a, a national market is? And my question is, is are you also saying that there are these informal markets and flows that are working against the national market, is that your argument? Yeah, uh, a number of different things. Uh, first, there are the geographical uh, disparities and differences. Some regions in uh, most of our countries are simply out of the market system just because they do not produce anything that can be traded or taken into the national market. They are uh, left uh, aside. Uh, that informal economy um, usually is built along local bases and regional bases. Uh, it's not integrated in the national market either. Um, also, we, we have the distortions and different structures of the labor markets. We do not have national labor markets with people moving you know, naturally from one part of another of the country. Four people depend a lot on family networks that are locally based. So they do not have that mobility that can have the population in Europe or North America, etc. So the labor market is not integrated. We have informal and formal economies. We have this geographic uh, uh, distribution of uh, production that is not uh, integrated. And also there's the problem of communication in areas of, uh, I don't know, in, in the southern part of Mexico, in the northern part of Guatemala, in the south, etc. In a, each one of our countries there are these uh, uh, problems. And we have to add that to, to that, uh, the problem of drug traffic, of guerrillas, etc., etc. So we still do not have integrated markets in almost any sense. And if we talk about those most integrated not only nationally but also integrated to the international sphere as the banking system well it attends only the, the upper 10 percent of population most of the economy does not use the, the the banking system you know there are all these sorts of popular banks and informal systems of savings and lending money etc so we don't have either a financial national market in most of our countries I'm, I'm really not sure that I understand the specificities of your argument to account for the rise of lynching since 1990. Mm. I mean, you seem to be arguing that for lack of a state, a, a, the lesser evil, the substitute, was, was systems of brokerage. And that brokers have been starved of resources or deprived of legitimacy. And it, it really isn't clear to me exactly whether there are single or multiple determinants of the breakdown of brokerage as a way of, of mediating for lack of a state. Yeah, well, there are numbers of reasons. The, the crisis of the political brokerage systems uh, date from the early 80s and depend on a lot of, uh, of uh, 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 different factors. Uh, maybe the most important of them is the lack of economic resources. With the deregulation policies, the liberalization, etc., uh, this system of public enterprises and public contracts and the negotiation with the unions, etc., uh, has left some brokers without resources. But then uh, there is all the systems of um, uh, how do we call it, uh, to, to make accountable the state, all, all these systems to, to supervise the state expenditure and uh, state action, etc., that also deprive the brokers of some of their power. 
Also, all the um, ideas of, uh, uh, that, that came along with the democratic transitions tended to overemphasize the importance of uh, elections. They served as platform for new political uh, leaderships that based its power on the discredit of those brokers that were at that time uh, uh, lessened in, uh, in the power. Um, in some cases, those old political classes were smashed by new leaders like, for example, Chavez in Venezuela, Fujimori in, uh, in Peru. Uh, phenomenons like Que Se Vayan Todos in, in Argentina is also a, uh, uh, an example, you know, a very telling example of a political class that is shattered as a wall. Uh, so there are a number, a number of, uh, of factors that have uh, debilitated at least this uh, traditional broker system. It is still strong. But what I find in, 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 the, in the case of the, the, the lynchings, for example, is that even though there might still be powerful political brokers in some places, in the labor unions, for example, in Mexico, uh, there are places where those uh, brokers cannot be found. Uh, you know, for well, this, I know it's this sort of minor history. Uh, uh, the the chief of police in Mexico City spent those four hours that lasted the riot since he was informed between the, the moment he got the information to the moment he got there to San Juan Extra Open, trying to get someone on the phone asking with whom I have to talk in San Juan Extra Open. And there was no one to talk to. No one could tell him because there was no link. What was broken was the link between the city police and a local leadership that was not anymore there in San Juan de Open. So th the problem was not, and of course, some local leaders emerged during the riot and afterwards and in the days after, but were independent and not linked to the government. So I saw there th the missing of a link. Something happened and the, the crowd could not be appeased. Uh, maybe the, the brokerage system can be rebuilt, but uh, it needs resources, it needs the capacity to negotiate the infringement of the law, uh, and maybe, just maybe, that's what Hugo Chavez is providing in building you know, these large constituencies that win one election after another. I'm not sure. On the subject of uh, a lack of resources as a problem to state weakness, I'm curious as to what, what you think the role is of the international community, of, of international financial institutions. And although you mentioned that some weak states who lack resources have a dependency on, on external funding, I'm curious whether whether such institutions can actually help build a strong state or that they merely perpetuate that dependency and that weakness? Uh, I'm not sure that uh, international financial institutions can in fact do anything decisive in, 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 in this line, along this line. Uh, nor to strengthen the state or to weaken it uh, further. Of course, uh, even when they impose these this restrictions on political uh, uh, expen public expenditure and uh, you know, when they require the payment of the debt payments, etc., uh, they contribute to the weakening of the state to a certain degree, then I would not put much responsibility on those uh, institutions. The main problem of the state is to um, uh, collect taxes that our states do not collect enough taxes. If you take, for example, uh, the, uh, as a percentage of the national income, uh, the value-added tax in a country like uh, any European country might be between 14%, 16 17%. If you look at a case of Mexico, a classic strong Latin American state, it's less than 3%. It does not collect taxes. And that's a problem. The, a source, a, a stable, long-term uh, source of income is only an internal source and mainly 
it's a tax source of income. So of course, the international uh, uh, financial institutions are a part of, of, of the problem, but I would not say that they are decisive to, to the situation. The, you mentioned well, the weakness of the state applied to Latin America. But you know, Latin America is not a homogeneous uh, geographical territory. So I'd like to see how do you apply or you explain this concept of the weakness of the state in Latin America applied specifically to Venezuela. If we you can pinpoint the actors or situation going on over there, and how this can impact in the rest of Latin America, or to analyze just Venezuela as a case study, would you say. I don't know your experience, and I have that experience in Venezuela. So I appreciate if you could pinpoint Venezuela to see what's going on, and how these uh, wings of the state, could you uh, elaborate on that? I, I'm not an, an expert. I, I, I have only a very uh, uh, light uh, knowledge of what's going on in Venezuela. Uh, it might be uh, an exemplary case of what I said. First, um, you know, this the, the liberalization of the economy and the, all the effects of the liberalization process in the in the early '80s, the discredit of the old political class the almost destruction of all the old political class, you know, with Carlos Andres Perez going to trial and jail, etc., and the discredit of Copella and Adecos altogether, both of them, uh, and the rising of a uh, uh, leader within this situation, but with a state that depends to a dramatic degree on oil revenues, that does not depend on taxes, but that needs uh, and depends on the oil, oil prices. Uh, that makes it uh, a really weak state in, in, in every sense. And the strengthening of Hugo Chavez's position uh, needs to weaken the state even further because uh, his political brokers, the, the political brokerage system he is building, depends on the possibility of controlling the judiciary, for example, and controlling the television networks again. So uh, he needs a weaker state, or at least uh, 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 enough, uh, as weak as it takes for him to build a political uh, stable network. And at the same time, it has resources as long as oil prices are high but it's not a uh, stable long-term uh, income, the one he has. So it, it is a very weak state. Even uh, Hugo Chavez has been capable of building a strong political uh, arrangement, able, capable of resisting an opposition, uh, really, uh, in, in a way that's astonishing with uh, such weak governments uh, as we've had in most of the continent for the past 10 or 15 years is really astonishing the way he has built his personal power. You know? I, I don't know much more. But I think uh, uh, the case of Venezuela is supposed to be decided to a debate, a debate, because even right now the income from, this, from the government income it's not only petroleum. He was able to increase the taxes. Even the, the income for taxes is greater than petroleum right now. So, of course, even the prices are very high in the international markets favor him. So, it's another thing that uh, they are positive. The other thing, they are not so positive because he doesn't have the team work around him uh, in to, to track him in the right way. So I think that what's happening in Venezuela, uh, it's supposed to come to some reflections. The first thing, there is a, a, a wrong conceptualization that the United States is Washington DC, as far as Venezuela is concerned. Even everything that is happening between Chavez and the US is between Chavez and Bush, or, and, and Washington, Caracas, Washington. So uh, the reality is that the United States is not only Washington. The state is only here, they have, they have certain autonomy. 
So that's the first mistake. The second mistake is that here also they think that Latin America is Caracas, Latin America is Bogotá, is Lima, and that's not true. There are, there are regions over there, and they have uh, their own structures, and they could deal in a different way. So I think that uh, 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 right now there is a, a, a lack of information of what's happening there. So this will be maybe for another uh, meeting such as this, just to talk about the, the case of Venezuela. I am not either with government or against government, but I think there is a, lot of, a lack of knowledge of what's going on there, that it uh, will have a tremendous impact on Latin America. Thanks. Can, I, can I move your, in, a, in a different direction, one that you really didn't open tonight? Uh, I mean, one theory of, of, the, of the Habsburg Baroque state is that it ruled through spectacle. I mean, Juan Antonio Maraval arguing that there was a kind of, of theater of the masses. And one argument that was made about democratization in Latin America was that television had the potential in some ways to, to paper over the weakness of the state. Um, what is your, I mean, uh, it, maybe it's ridiculous to ask you for a single statement about the impact of, of the growth of a television public upon the processes that you've just been describing. But would you argue that it has had the effect of, I mean, strengthening or weakening, stabilizing, destabilizing the, the sorts of state building that you seem to want? Uh, as for the overall effect of um, television on the political scene, I, I'm not sure uh, either of the manipulation of, of TV or the, 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 the power they, uh, it has. One thing it, it has made and um, is creating sort of tight control over the politician. It has served not uh, 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 maybe as a way of controlling the state or, or, or asking for accountability to state institutions, but it, uh, it, the, the television networks have power over the individuals of the political class. Since the television can expose political corruption, for example, in very dramatic uh, uh, and even funny ways, as has happened in Peru, in Mexico, etc. So when a politician knows that he can be shown on national TV, you know, with a portfolio full of dollar bills, as we've seen in all our countries, you know, he knows he's vulnerable. So the police has a lot of power on over the politicians over the political class, maybe not uh, 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 in front of the state, you know, it, it is quite different because the political corruption can be shown and prosecuted in the tribunals with no special consequence for the state as a structure, but it can destroy a political, a personal political career. So um, I think, the, 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 of course, it has power, but the power of television has the possibility of being exerted especially towards individuals within the political class. It would be a very different uh, uh, argument than this. I to think about that, but uh, what we know as a fact is the fear that those individuals have of, of TV, of being exposed on TV. I want to ask you, like, which role do you think it plays the generation differences and who the disorders were? In this particular riot, okay, we, because we know everything. Um, we saw, to state it briefly, the wall people of San Juan Nixtayopan. The riot started, for, we, for what we know, when a woman of 40, 50 years started shouting that those men in the in the uh, uh, police uh, in the car it was a car these guys you know this civilian car uh, that they were kidnapping children they are they were near uh, uh, a secondary school and the, the, this woman started to shout they are trying to kidnap our children stop them etc etc now it, it seems that this woman has connections with the guerrilla that have connections with the drug traffic that have etc etc but it was a middle-aged woman and so it was the women that were waiting for their children's or taking the children's to school that first reacted and surrounded 
the car. And afterwards came some men of different ages. But in the videos we can see uh, teenagers, you know, just jumping, shouting and dancing. Teenagers, 12, 13, 14 year old boys. And the leaders that emerged from the crowd were a couple of, of men of about 50, 60 or 70 years. The one that, uh, one that, that, that uh, um, you know, took the megaphone from, from Gilberto Sastia was a man of about 70 years that became sort of a leader of, uh, of San Juan Ixtayopa at that moment because it appears that he has had uh, some studies of law. He's not a lawyer, but he studied law somehow, and so he knew what had to be done. So we saw people of all ages. I, I had a question, uh, just a, a little bit about the getting from here to there. Uh, I remember your topic reminds me of an observation by, by Malcolm Dees about Colombia, which is a country where um, you can imagine it being a country where, of course, the topic of the weakness of the state is perennial, especially when a country has like three irregular armies, and you can imagine that there, is, there are some issues of state weakness to be, to be addressed. And, and his comment was, yeah, you know, I, I could go into Colombia for 20 years or 30 years and so on, and people always lament the lack of a strong state and so on. But he was saying, but when push comes to show, Colombians really don't want to go for the strong state. And historically, they have been rejecting the strong state. And so the 19th century, they, whenever they were given an alternative, they were rejecting it because they, they are very leery of this authority. So the problem is the state has to be created out of the citizenry. And it, uh, so I don't know what is the roadmap, basically. Yeah, of course, the, the main problem, uh, if it is a problem, is that uh, there is an alternative to the strong t state. There has been an alternative and an alternative that has worked more or less uh, for centuries. Of course, people, whatever that means, you know, people decide in different degrees, they have different capacities, etc. But, right, Malcolm was right, people reject the, the, the state and the rule of law because there is another, an alternative order that suits better those heterogeneous, unequal uh, populations in Latin American countries. They have rejected the, the state, the strong state, the rule of law, etc. Uh, and they have built, in consequence, a different political order. But the problem is that that political order seems to uh, hamper the development of some institutions. Uh, uh, at some point, uh, that political order is not uh, compatible with economic development or with uh, economic growth. Um, and the, the whole political classes in our countries seem to be shattered by the fact that they are not just not delivering the goods. Uh, of course, the uh, distinction you, you, you make is, is, uh, reminds me of the one made by Jean-François Bayard uh, when, when talking about the states in Africa. He, he uses to say that there's a difference between organizing a state that only requires a few people in an office. You know, they write a constitution and they say, well, you, you're a minister of this and that, etc. You, you can organize a state within a week and dozen people. And Something else is the process of creating a state, and that needs the will of the people, you know, some sort of shared identity, etc. And it's a long process of fights and wars, etc. To all right, we've had we have organized states in Latin America, but the process of the creation of state somehow has been uh, lacking, and I would think that. In fact, it has been oriented the other way around. I, every time there has been a major political conflict in most of our countries, it has not been towards strengthening the state and concentrating power and authority, but towards dispersing power and authority and resisting that. Uh, so one thing, I am not sure if the people want a strong state. I know that maybe the market under the present circumstances, needs a stronger state, but still it is a political choice. And I am not sure where and how. Can you give some examples of how countries, of how it's in the world's superpowers like the United States, the Soviet Union, 
have exerted their influence in some Latin American countries, and if, if in your analysis, uh, if those influences have more often weakened states in Latin America or strengthened, strengthened states in Latin America? Uh, of course, uh, to think about interventions of both uh, uh, the states and the Soviet Union, you know, it, it's a very long list of very different kinds of intervention. Uh, mainly, most of them have been oriented towards the weakening of the state, as a rule. Um, any way of um, subordinating a government or of destabili destabilizing a, a government is a way of weakening its political basis. Uh, I'm not sure I can find an example of an hegemonic uh, uh, state strengthening the states around it, unless it's in a way an attempt to incorporate them. The economic uh, European Union serves to that. It, it, it has strengthened the states of its member and of the members the, of the countries that want to become members because they want to incorporate them, so they want those states, you know, Poland on, or uh, uh, even Turkey now, to have stronger states because they are planning to uh, incorporate them. It's not the case of the states in Latin America, and of course it was not the case uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, yes, I, I do think that as the situation is currently in Latin America, to strengthen the state requires to enlarge the state, the, the state capacity to control markets. Uh, deregulated, liberalized markets nowadays leave the state powerless to orient the economy. Our states have almost no resources to have any economic policy at all. In fact, they only have monetary policies and very reduced margin to define monetary policies. Uh, it's hard to strengthen the state in that way. They need to be able to build uh, an income, a reliable income through taxes, uh, provide the basis for uh, slowly uh, 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 homogenizing process uh, they need to provide not only schools and health for most of the population, but also energy. Because when, when one of the problems of the privatization of energy that is much talked about in Mexico and other countries in Latin America is that it does not take into account that most of the rural areas and the large parts of the countries have energy because it is a public enterprise. Because they are not profitable. No, no market would deliver energy. And if we have uh, uh, segments of population, even regions, without electric energy, for example, well, that would widen the political gap even further than uh, uh, it is now. Uh, so there are a number of issues that our states have to address. For because of the, 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 the economic uh, and social situation of our countries, I think we need larger states, and of course not uh, um, reduce the economic capacities even more than they are. But of course, it goes against the common sense uh, that uh, everyone shares these days. Uh, that's, I guess it's one of the reasons why the states have been weakened recently. And one of the reasons not to expect too much for the near future.